Hey, what's up YouTube? I hope you're doing well. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the gem float algorithm, GFA for short. It's a very cool algorithm, most often used to generate Voronoi patterns and distance fields quite efficiently. On paper, the algorithm isn't that complex, but somehow I personally found it really confusing at first. It's one of those algorithms where I had to pay really close attention to what was going on at the pixel level to really get a good grasp of its inner workings. Looking at a code implementation also tremendously helped, as usual. Speaking of which, I've linked in the video description below a cool GLSL code example, one I'll go over later on in this video. Anyway, the GFA is nothing new. There are plenty of videos on the subject and plenty of papers as well, like this great article from Ben, that other article from Lena Piquet, and this great and very exhaustive thesis from this other person, which name I shall not pronounce to not butcher it. And the Wikipedia page points to that other great paper, co-signed by the same person. Anyway, UI comes with a blueprint-based GFA implementation, but it's a tiny bit messy and a bit hidden away, so unfortunately not the best educational resource. Now, again, the jump load algorithm isn't too complex, but the devil lies in the details, and there's a lot that can be said about it. I'll however try to keep things as simple as can be so you can get a good grasp on a basic implementation and then it's up to you to dive deeper if you so desire, okay? So in this video I'll first go over the theory, then I'll show how to implement the algorithm in Unreal Engine using blueprints and render targets. Then I'll take a brief detour from Unreal Engine and walk you through a GLSL implementation. Finally, I'll conclude the video by showing how the algorithm can also be implemented using Niagara. Let's dive right into it then, shall we? Alright, let's pretend we are looking at a small texture, so this is a grid of pixels. And let's assume that texture is entirely black except for those two pixels. And just to make sure we are on the same track, we are working in UV space here. So this is the texture's U-axis and this its V-axis. To further state the obvious, both pixels here share the same V-coordinate but have a different U-coordinate, right? Also, they have a different grayscale value, one is brighter than the other. I said grayscale value and not color for a reason, I'll explain later on. Now, the way I see it, the jump float algorithm lets us propagate each pixel's UV coordinates so that during the propagation, we can do a couple of distance checks and only propagate pixels as far as they are allowed to go, if that makes sense. Meaning here, the algorithm would spread that grayscale value like so, nicely split in the middle. It would also spread those two pixels UV coordinates and thus let us build a distance field. So that's the idea. How does it work though? Well, the first step is to perform some kind of initialization, and the way this is done can vary a tiny bit depending on how we want to do things. Here, I'm going to do the following. If a pixel has a grayscale value, I'm first going to store its grayscale value in the blue channel, and then write this pixel's UV coordinates in the red and green channels. And from now on, I'm going to refer to the UV coordinates a pixel may store as the position it points to. Right now, this pixel stores UVs that are its own UVs, right? So this pixel points to itself. Last bit of information, a black pixel, one that does not store UV coordinates, is going to be treated a bit differently by the algorithm. So I'm gonna call such pixel an undefined pixel, okay? So those two are defined and the rest are undefined. Cool, that's what you may call the initialization path. Now, the jump float algorithm processes every single pixel, one at a time, just like any typical pixel shader. It's also an iterative algorithm, meaning it produces its final result after a number of iterations. We'll see in a minute how to calculate the amount of iterations needed, but for now, let's do, say, four iterations, okay? Alright then, let's have a look at the very first iteration, and let's assume the algorithm is currently processing this pixel. Why this one? Well, why not? So it's an undefined pixel, right? It's black and thus stores no UV coordinates, thus points to nothing. Next step is to look at the pixel's eight neighboring pixels. Now the distance at which we are going to do so is very specific, and I'm going to call that distance the step size. It's simply based on the amount of iterations to perform and the current iteration, meaning it's 2 to the power of amount of iterations to perform, we say it 4, minus the current iteration, 1. In our case, that's 2 to the power of 3, 8. So we are going to look at this pixel's neighbors 8 pixels away. For each, if defined, get the UV coordinates it stores, meaning check where it points to, 
and see how distant that is to the process pixel's own position. If that distance is smaller than the distance from this pixel's own position to the position it currently points to, or if it currently points to nothing, then propagate or copy this neighboring pixel. And that's pretty much it. It might sound confusing for now, but it will hopefully make sense with this step-by-step -step demonstration. So this pixel and its neighboring pixels are all undefined, so it remains undefined. Next pixel, that one is defined, but its neighboring pixels are all undefined, so it remains defined as it currently is. Next pixel is undefined, but one of its neighboring pixels is defined, so it's copied. And remember, this pixel stores its own UV coordinates in the red and green channels, right? So now this pixel stores UV coordinates that point to B. So it's like every pixel that is propagated by the GFA has a way to point back to quote-unquote where it came from, and this is at the heart of the algorithm. We'll see that it serves a great purpose in just a second. Moving on next pixel, it's undefined and its neighbors are as well, so it remains undefined. And that's true for the next few pixels, until we arrive at this one, and here again we fall into known territory. It's undefined and has only one defined neighboring pixel, so copy it. That pixel now stores UV coordinates that point to A. Next pixel is defined and this time one of its neighboring pixels is also defined. However, B obviously points to B itself and that other pixel also points to B. So a distance check is performed to see which target is closer to the process pixel, but here that would result in a null distance in both cases. Because again, B points to B, so the distance from itself to itself is zero, and same for that pixel. So the result is kinda undefined and arbitrary, and here is where the GFA sometimes fails. This algorithm does not always output a pixel perfect result. Here it's no biggie, both pixels point to the same target, so it doesn't matter which one to pick. But at times the algorithm may process a pixel equally distant to two or more different coordinates, and it has to pick a solution. In practice though, errors are few, and the magnitude of errors is generally tiny and not a concern for most use cases. Anyway, moving on. Nothing happens for the next few pixels until that one. It's undefined and has one single defined neighboring pixel, so copy it, you get the idea. Running this logic on every single pixel, we end up with this texture. And that's the first GFA iteration, with a step size of 8. On to the second iteration then. Each iteration, the step size is reduced by half, so it's no longer 8, but 4 pixels. Let's run the algorithm step by step for a couple more pixels, just to get familiar with it. This pixel, for instance, is undefined and has undefined neighbors 4 pixels away, so it remains undefined. Next pixel is defined but has undefined neighbors, so keep it as is. And finally, say that pixel, it's undefined and has 2 defined neighbors, but both point to A, so again the distance check is ambiguous, but at least one of the two is copied. Rinse and repeat, and that's the second iteration. On to the third one then, again half the step size, so two, and by now you should be familiar with what's going to happen. Now having chosen such a simple example, it's for now still not that obvious how the GFA's magic operates, but stay with me, it's going to happen. Anyway, this pixel is defined but has undefined neighboring pixels, two pixels away, so keep it as is. Same for that one. That one is undefined and has two similarly defined neighboring pixels, so again, ambiguous distance check, thus copies of the two, right? Nothing new. Rinse and repeat, and that's the third iteration. On to the fourth and final iteration, then, half the step size again, one, and this is where, with this very simple example, things get interesting. Let's process this pixel. It is defined, it points to A, right? It also has two defined neighboring pixels, one pixel away, and both point to B. Thus, the distance check would tell this pixel is closer to B than A, so B is a better fit, so copy the neighboring pixel that points to B. Here both do, so it's once again an ambiguous distance check, but it doesn't matter, one of the two is copied. So this pixel actually changes quote-unquote color and now points to a new target. Similarly, let's check what happens with say that pixel. It is defined and points to B, and it has two neighboring pixels that both point to A. Which target is closest to this pixel? Well, A. So copy one of the two neighboring pixels that points to A. Rinse and repeat, and voila! This last iteration, having a step size of 1, 
fills all the remaining gaps and overrides tons of pixels to produce this final image. The red and green channels contain on that side UV coordinates that point to A and to B on that other side. That blue channel contains that grayscale value that got flooded like we assumed it would, nicely split right in between those two points. Sweet. Very last step is to build the distance field and it's super duper simple. Compute the distance from each pixel to where they point to and ta-da! Now repeat the same process with a bunch of randomly scattered points and you get a Voronoi pattern. Isn't that great? And say with the outline of a shape, you get that shape's distance field. Kinda sweet. Now that we understand the theory, let's have a look at an implementation in Unreal Engine using HLSL, which should hopefully consolidate our understanding of the algorithm. First, I build a list of 9 offsets to create a 3x3 kernel. Then I ensure the GFA step size never goes below 1 because it really must not. Then I make sure the given UVs are rounded to point coordinates to prevent any kind of pixel interpolation. It's extremely important to not sample the texture in between pixels. That could average two or more UV coordinates and thus create well-made-up coordinates and thus point to nowhere in particular. But I have more to say about this in a minute. Then I assume this pixel is going to be undefined for now. I also assume the smallest distance to a target that we found so far is, at first, a huge distance. This ensures that any pixel sampled in the 3x3 grid that is defined automatically succeeds this distance test. That way it's for sure copied, so we always do have at least one pixel to copy if there's at least one that should be copied, if that makes sense. Then I loop through that 3x3 pixel grid, build UV coordinates, which are the base UVs, plus one of these offsets, multiplied by the GFA step size, based on the current iteration, remember, and the texel size because we work with UVs, so in a 0 to 1 normalized range. Then sample the texture and make sure to sample the MIP level 0 to once again prevent any kind of pixel interpolation. If that pixel is undefined, meaning it stores no UVs, skip it and proceed to the next pixel. Else I compute the distance from the processed pixel to where that pixel in this 3x3 grid points to. If smaller than the current best distance, well, this pixel points to something closer, so it should be propagated. It's a better result. And again, that distance is, at first, huge, so the first distance check always succeeds, right? And that's pretty much it. That's a single GFA iteration. It always amazes me to see great algorithms implemented in so few lines of code. Anyway, let's have a quick look at how this HLSL code can be used to fully implement the GFA in Unreal Engine using blueprints. First, I created two RGBA 32 bits render targets. I tried 16 bits render targets, but suffered from the loss in precision, so it looks like 32 bits is a requirement. I then created three materials. First one is some kind of initialization material, so the GFA has something to work with, which can be anything really. Here I chose to spawn random points, so this function outputs those points UVs in the red and green channels and a random scalar value in the blue channel, exactly like I previously described during the step-by-step -step breakdown. The second material is the jump load algorithm itself. It samples a given texture, has two parameters set in blueprint for the iteration count, and uses a material function that calls the HLSL code I just showcased a minute ago. The third and last material just outputs a texture set in blueprint. It will be relevant in a second. I then created a blueprint actor. It has a couple of settings to specify the render targets and materials to use. A single function, callable in editor, performs the GFA a number of times. In that function, I first check if the specified render target size is valid. Then I ensure render targets are all valid, resize them if needed, and clear them. Next, I draw the initialization material to generate random points on that first render target. Then I create a dynamic instance of that GFA material. Next, I compute how many iterations to perform based on that step mode. It's either a user set or automatically derived from the render target size, more on that in a minute. And I forward that iteration max count to that material dynamic instance. Good, now the time to actually run the jump load algorithm. As usual, iterating on a render target is not really possible, you can't read from it while writing into it. There are many solutions around this issue, here the best course of action is to use a ping pong method meaning that initialization pass writes to the buffer A. That GFA material then first read from buffer A 
iterates on it and the result is written into buffer B. Next iteration, read from buffer B and write into buffer A, and so on and so on. That's what we call a ping pong. Once that's done, if the last iteration was written into buffer B, I copy B into A, and that's where that third simple material comes into play. That's just a silly way for me to ensure the latest iteration is always in that first render target, and that the one I sample in my materials or the one I convert to a static texture, right? And that's pretty much it. So in manual mode, that's one iteration, two, three, four, five. You see, it doubles the amount of quote-unquote propagation each iteration. In automatic mode, that setting is well automatically set to 9 it seems. Why 9 you may ask? Well, it's simply log base 2 of the texture's resolution. 2 to the power of 9 equals 512. And 512 is indeed this render target's resolution. This ensures all pixels are propagated across the entire texture and that's easily demonstrated. Let's assume I have a pixel right there at that edge. It would need to be at most propagated to the other side, right? Now it's a 512 texture, so the first GFA iteration would propagate that pixel 256 pixels that way. Second iteration, 128 pixels further that way. Then 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And that pixel has indeed been propagated across the entire texture in 9 iterations. And if I cheat a bit and tweak this blueprint like so, we can visualize this. That's one iteration. See, that pixel has been propagated 256 pixels that way. Two iterations. Three, four, five, six, seven, something starts to emerge. Eight, we're getting close. And nine, boom, done. Sweet. Now, let's take a sidestep for just a moment and quickly study a GLSL implementation because I want to explain something important. Here's the GLSL shader authored by the one and only Alan Wolf. Shout out to him, feel free to check out his blog, it's full of tech goodies. Anyway, this code is the entire GFA algorithm. Well, actually, this tiny bit of code is the algorithm, the rest is pretty much unrelated. Let me explain. Remember when I said these first two pixels had a grayscale value and not a color, right? I said that for a very specific reason. Assuming our texture here is RGBA and that we have to pack UV coordinates in at least two channels for the jump load algorithm to work, let's say in the red and green channels, we end up with two unused channels, blue and alpha. Our deck color is RGB, so we are short of one channel if we want to store color as well as UVs. That's five channels in total. Except that, huh, not really. This code here assumes an RGB color is 8 bits per channel, so 256 integers per channel. Having made this assumption, it becomes possible to pack two 8 bits integers into a 32 bits float, and that's exactly what this does. It packs that color's red and green components into the blue channel of this RGBA texture, the Z component here, and that color's remaining blue channel is stored in the alpha channel, the W component plus UVs in the X and Y components, of course. Now that we have UVs on a color packed, well, we probably need to unpack them, right? And that's what this decode function does. It unpacks a vector 4 into a pair of UVs on an RGB color. Now, I won't go over too much details here. Bit packing is out of scope of this video, and I've already explained a similar technique in a previous video, so feel free to check it out. Anyway, that's how the jump float algorithm is here made to propagate those points color with just four channels by using bit packing. Moving on, this shader generates random points and colors using math, so there are a few functions for that purpose, namely those two hash functions. One outputs a random 2D position and one a random RGB color. How these hash functions work isn't important. They just crumble values in various arbitrary ways, pretty much. So this whole code section is actually unrelated to the GFA. The algorithm itself is really just that tiny function, and it shares much resemblance to my HLSL code. This computes the step size based on the amount of iterations to perform and the current iteration. It assumes an undefined pixel at first, and that high distance value makes the first distance check down there be true. The 3x3 kernel is then looped through using two separate for loops, top to bottom, left to right. Same, but different. It then unpacks UVs on an RGB color from the RGBA image channels. And if that pixel is defined, it checks the distance to only copy the one that points to the closest thing. 
just like I explained earlier, and rinse and repeat for all 9 pixels. Finally, pack the best UV coordinates and RGB color we got into an RGBA value. This GFA function is then called on tick so that iteration index increases every frame, and the GFA thus works with a step size divided by 2 every frame until the step size reaches 1 for the final iteration. So you see it's no different than my HLSL implementation. In fact, HLSL and GLSL are extremely similar, so it's most often super straightforward to go from one to the other. That being said, I wanted to go over this GLSL code because it illustrates an important notion when it comes to the GFA. You can choose to propagate a scalar value, or two, or three and more, with that bit packing method I just explained, along with UVs, right? Or you can choose to propagate nothing but UVs, because at the end, the propagated UVs do point to where every pixel got propagated from, if that makes sense. Meaning, for instance, that grayscale value can be propagated along with UVs with the GFA, right? Or, once the GFA is done, propagated UVs can be used to retrieve that grayscale value and generate the same final result. Same, but different. It's hard to explain, but hopefully you get my point. And honestly, I'm not sure what's the best approach. I'm not convinced there's one better way, I suppose it depends on your use case and all, and I'm not convinced one is necessarily more performant than the other either. I guess it requires less memory bandwidth to propagate nothing but UVs, but you do have to do one more sample at the end to retrieve the value you intended to propagate, so meh. Anyway, I felt like this was an important concept to grasp and something I definitely wanted to point out. Alright, we are almost done. I still need to show you guys how I implemented the GFA in Unreal Engine using Niagara, so let's go. First things first, I created an empty Niagara system and added a render target user parameter and made it point to a, well, render target. Next, I created an empty GPU emitter, added a grid2d parameter to it, made sure its format was set to float. I then added a first simulation stage and configured it to iterate on the 2D grid interface. All these simulation stages do iterate on the 2D grid interface, by the way, so I will only mention it once. To that first simulation stage, I added a custom model to generate pseudo-random points exactly like that GLSL example does. Same code, it outputs a vector that stores UVs in its X and Y components and a random scalar value in its Z component. That vector is written into the 2D grid simply by using the stack context namespace. This namespace is quote-unquote smart, Meaning, when used within a simulation stage, it tries to interface with whatever that simulation stage iterates on, particles or data interface. So this here essentially sets a vector, named data, in the 2D grid cell the GPU currently computes. Cool, so that simulation stage is the GFA initialization path. Next simulation stage, that one loops a number of times to create that iterative GFA process, right? And this custom module just runs the jumpload algorithm using HLSL code. It's almost identical to the code I showed earlier, but there are a few exceptions, because we no longer sample a texture in a material, but work with a 2D grid interface within a simulation stage. So first, get the current simulation iteration and max iterations to derive the GFA step size. Then get the 2D grid cell X and Y index and grid cell count to derive UVs in a 0 to 1 range. And the rest is almost identical, except that instead of using a texture sampler to read a given pixel's value, this 2D grid interface function is called to get a given grid cell RGB vector, but it's essentially the same thing. Then that grid cell's vector is updated on and on until all iterations are performed. At this point, the jump float algorithm is done, so I get the result and can say generate a distance field. And finally, export that 2D grid into a render target. Noise. Just have to make sure this 2D grid and render target have the same size. To go a little further, here's another example. Here, I make use of Niagara's G-Buffer interface to access the custom stencil buffer. Just have to make sure it's enabled in your project settings and that your actors do output to it. I then perform a simple edge detection algorithm to create outlines, 
using the jump load algorithm to create a distance field. Distance field remapped to create outlines of any thickness. The result is sampled in a post-process material, further masked with a custom stencil buffer, and voila, Niagara-driven outlines. Sadly though, the 2D grid interface seems to have a lot of overhead, because it looks to be somewhat costly. I'm not sure why exactly, this algorithm is really not supposed to be that expensive, so meh, mileage may vary. To conclude on this awesome algorithm, I just wanted to mention a couple more things. The GFA can create distance fields in 2D space, but can as well create distance fields in 3D space. It's the same exact logic, but instead of looking at a pixel's 8 neighboring pixels in a 2D texture, you look at its 26 neighboring pixels in a volume texture, and that's pretty much it. Yui's Volumetrics plugin features a 3D GFA, so feel free to check it out. Next, due to its nature, the GFA outputs an image that has a lot of aliasing. There are, however, a few solutions to create anti-aliasing. UE's Volumetrics plugin tries to solve this by smoothing the GFA input and applying a specific edge detection algorithm, similar to what Ben suggests in his article, I think. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. It's not something I personally investigated much, so I'll let you do your own research. Also, and I briefly explained this earlier, the GFA doesn't cope well at all with pixel interpolation. Any kind of sampling done during the GFA and with the GFA's output must be precisely centered on each pixel. For instance, here I'm simply creating a distance field. So this texture contains the propagated UVs and I create the distance field by computing the distance from each pixel to where they point to, right? Well, see those artifacts? What happens there? If we zoom in, it's like that pixel right there on screen led to a texture sample right here. So due to the texture's billionaire filtering, that sample results in a mix between that pixel and that one. However, remember that pixel contains UVs, right? It points to A and that pixel points to B. And mixing those UVs means averaging those two targets. And thus, the average result points to somewhere right in between. And that screws up everything. That's why whenever that kind of interpolation between different targets happens, you get those artifacts. So it's really important to avoid this by rounding UV coordinates to the nearest pixel. Once the distance field is baked though, if you do bake it, that's no longer necessary. It's only relevant when you sample pixels that do store UV coordinates, right? Last bit of information, and that one drove me crazy. It's obvious, yet somehow I completely glanced over this detail and ran in circles for two days. You see, to create this screen space outline effect, I continuously resize render targets to match the viewport's resolution, thus obviously creating non-square render targets. And creating outlines by thresholding the resulting GFA's distance field, I at first had stretched outlines. They were thicker than taller. Hmm. But that's to be expected, because UVs are in a 0 to 1 range, right? So a square texture is in that range, as well as a non-square texture. Meaning, in that square texture, a spherical mask with a radius of, say, 0.5 looks round, right? But looks stretched in that non-square texture. Thus, creating some kind of outlines with a stretched distance field results in outlines having a non-uniform thickness. To avoid this, you have to make the jump load algorithm take into account that texture's ratio and work with UVs that go beyond a 0 to 1 range. That way, the distance field is no longer stretched, which results in outlines having a uniform thickness. And voila, that's pretty much all I had to say regarding this awesome algorithm. Project files are available as a tier 2 reward on my Patreon. I've included a bunch of blueprint and Niagara examples. That's it, I hope you liked the video. Feel free to leave a like if you did, and consider subscribing to the channel. Also, feel free to check out my Patreon for tons of cool educative UE projects and demos. Thanks so much for your support, I'll see you in the next one, take care of yourself, bye bye!